So, Stefan, welcome to this session. Um, uh, how are you doing? Yeah, thanks, Martin. Doing well. Thanks very much for having me. So, today, Stefan is going to um, highlight some of the work Blackboard have done around implementing GD GDPR for Blackboard, but also, I think, as part of that, um, just do some general awareness raising around GDPR and some uh, hopefully useful tips and guidance that you can apply to um, other aspects so outside the Blackboard. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Stefan. Thanks very much, Martin, and, and thanks everyone for joining. I mean, it, it's good to see that um, quite a few have decided to join this webinar over lunchtime. Um, it's not a necessarily easily digestible topic, the GDPR, um, but I think many of you have seen this now in newspapers, and when even my wife now knows what GDPR stands for. It doesn't mean she's interested in my work yet, but at least that's the first step. So, um, I just want to quickly introduce myself before we go into the content. Um, and as Martin mentioned, feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. I also make sure that um, I stop at some of the sections so you can ask some questions there. And obviously, I try to make sure we have some time at the end for any questions you may have. So my name is Stefan Gehring. I've joined Blackboard almost a year ago as their global privacy officer. So I'm not just responsible for the EU and the GDPR, but just for data privacy compliance globally. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that I'm based here in London, so Blackboard wanted to hire someone here in the EU, um, or at least Europe, uh, very much aware that obviously Europe is the epicenter of data privacy at the moment, and they wanted to have someone who understands uh, the cultural background of, of data privacy and not just someone in the US. I've, um, as you can tell from my accent, um, I'm originally from Switzerland. Uh, I worked for a long time for one of the regional data protection authorities in Switzerland in my last job as a deputy data protection commissioner. And in that capacity, I also worked a lot with universities and schools to help make sure that they can comply with their data protection laws and, and help the individuals and their students. Um, when I moved over to the UK 10 years ago, I, I first joined uh, Barclays in, in a privacy role and then uh, later on moved over to Citigroup, so two financial services. And then my last role was the EMEA and Asia Park Chief Privacy Officer at Citigroup um, before I moved over to Blackboard. So what do we want to cover today? Um, as Martin mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about the GDPR in general, but not too much because I think most of you will be now by now fairly familiar with the requirements. I'm not going to go through them in all detail. I just wanted to highlight a few things around why we think that data privacy is so important and also explain a little bit, but not too much detail, how we set up a program just in terms of, because I think it can be helpful for others as well. Um, and explain how what we do things helps our client. But I think the focus here, and I'm going to try to spend most of the time really on, first of all, some implementation tips from our experience and also showing how we translated some of the specific GDPR requirements into practice because I think that's probably most helpful for everyone on, on this webinar. I also included um, some uh, helpful resources in appendix. I I'm not sure, Martin, if you're going to share the slides later on, otherwise I can circulate it. And what we normally do is we have a, a community web page uh, where we um, uh, publish, publish all our um, webinars and our slides that really, so you can definitely find it there later. So as mentioned, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all the GDPR requirements in all detail, but I think it's quite helpful to take a step back um, in terms of why, why do we have the GDPR at all? Why, why is there a new law? And uh, many of you will have been involved in that. There was uh, long negotiations in Brussels around exactly all that the relevant provisions should look like. Uh, but if you look at the driver behind of this, it was the, the EU Data Protection Directive that we have currently that's implemented in the UK, so the Data Protection Act 1998, um, was really um, kind of getting a bit old in terms of um, some of the aspects of it. And um, even though some of the principles were still good and usable and technology neutral, the regulators and the legislators really felt that um, we need to have a better approach. And the concern was mainly around the kind of 
new technologies and new internet services, well, they felt that particularly U.S. internet services um, weren't um, weren't being able to be targeted. Um, and if you look at this as a background, you kind of ex understand quite a few of those kind of massive changes that we see with the GDPR. I mean, first of all, the the enormous big finding level of up to 4% of global turnover I mean, is a clear sign that anyone should really take data privacy now, data protection really, really seriously. And it's not something you can just kind of balance against other interests. Um, secondly, also, if you think about the extended territorial scope, there are now also organizations outside the EU are, um, need to apply the GDPR if they provide uh, or offer products and services to EU residents. That's quite clearly kind of with the kind of the aspect of some of the US companies so far not having to be fully under the regulatory power of our data protection authorities here in the EU. And then if you think about the, the right to erasure, the right to data portability, these are all rights that are very much kind of tailored for internet services um, to make sure that obviously if, um, if you have, if you use a service on the internet that you can delete data as required and you can port some of your data over to competitor services and you're not locked into a specific um, service. I think that, that that's quite important to keep in mind. And I think that's also kind of, um, differentiate us and similar vendors like us from kind of these kind of companies because we are not we don't have a business model where we monetize data of users we really we're using data that's provided by universities to make sure they can use our learning management systems or tools like this that we're just using right now that the collaborate ultra version um, to make sure that that um, has all the data that's required to, for it to work and for clients to make sure it works effectively um, so that, that's a big difference, but um, like any other company here in, based in the EU or provides uh, services, we obviously need to make sure that we comply with the GDPR and we take it very, very seriously. So I wanted to talk uh, about a few of what I call the GDPR myths uh, and debunk some of them. Um, we've seen these kind of in conversation with clients. Um, you can see those on some kind of, uh, sometimes on the internet, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and it's understandable because there has been, first of all, quite a lot of developments as part of the GDPR and the legislative process around it. And also, I mean, the GDPR has some complex um, provisions and some provisions that are not absolutely clear. But it's understandable that some of these myths have been appearing. But I think it's also important to kind of really clarify what's, what's fact versus fiction. So the first one I want to talk about is, is consent. And quite often you hear that, well, with new GDPR, you need consent for everything. And that, that's just not true. The fact is that consent is one of several legal bases that you can use uh, to legitimately use personal information or personal data. Um, other bases are, for example, if you need data for the performance of a contract, or if you need it for your uh, own legitimate interest of a company, if that interest is, is not outweighed by the interest of the individual. And consent, quite frankly, is probably not the best legal basis to use for processing because the bar for consent has become very, very high. So unless there's a really genuine free choice of an individual, um, a choice of that individual wouldn't be considered valid consent. So for example, this has been, um, debated in the context of employment. So if I as an employee need to use Blackboard's time management system and uh, goals system, then I can't consent to that because I need to use these systems. Um, that's kind of part and parcel of, of my employment here. So I don't really have a, a choice and because I have a, don't have a choice, then consent is not really the right mechanism. So I think that's very important to keep in mind because it's not that different in the student context where some of the students will be expected to use certain tools in the university and they don't really have a free choice. So again, consent from the students um, may not always be valid in, in those circumstances. The second aspect I want to talk about is the, the breach notification period. And, and the, the mandatory breach notification is, of course, an important change from the GDPR, but there's been a lot of confusion around it. And it's only been recently that the Article 29 Working Party, the group of the European Data Protection Service, has clarified that in a bit more detail in their guidance. Because a lot of what we heard and what we saw in our RFPs and contract negotiations was that clients tried to 
gives us very, very short um, notification periods of 24 hours. And the reason why they did was that they thought, well, if I have 72 hours, then obviously I need to know from a vendor very, very quickly so that I still have, I don't know, 48 hours uh, myself to kind of figure out what I need to do and then I can inform the regulator. <clears throat> but that, that assumption is, is wrong. And as mentioned, the Article 29 Working Party has clarified this. In, in the fact is that we need, as a vendor or any other vendor that you may have, would need to notify you with undue delay and only once your vendor has notified you, then the 72 hour period starts. So that's when you be considered to become aware of that incident. So there's no need to bake in kind of additional time for your vendors to notify in the 72 hours because the 72 hours only really start once you are notified by your vendors or data processors. And I think the, the other important thing to um, uh, mention is that the GDP also mentions that the notification should be made in 72 hours to the regulators where feasible. And I think that's quite important because I mean, any uh, of you that may have had uh, already some uh, experience in incidents will know it's, it's very, very difficult with um, very, very difficult to uh, provide meaningful information within 72 hours because uh, a lot of the time in incidents, there's little um, there's little information that you have, you're still trying to figure out what's going on. And therefore, I think many of the regulators and the Information Commission, you guys already acknowledged that, is that there may be some initial information that you can provide, but it's quite likely that you need to provide more information later on. Then um, the third myth uh, I wanted to talk about is um, data transfers outside the EU. And this is, we, we hear that a lot from our customers. It's a big concern. And I think there's also a bit of a misconception here that um, many people think that it's just not possible to have data transferred outside of the EU or only if the client can contain for each and every data transfer. And that, that's not correct. Um, while the EU, of course, has very strict requirements around data transfer with the idea that if data is being transferred outside of the EU, that all the rights and the obligations should follow that data so that an adequate level of data protection is ensured. Um, this still means that it is possible to do so as long as the right mechanisms are in place. And I mean, many of you will have heard there's the EU-US Privacy Shield mechanism that, had, that we are certified of. There are also so-called model clauses or standard contractual clauses that allow um, data to be transferred outside the EU. Um, and um, the binding corporate rules and some other mechanisms in place. And as long as these mechanisms are used, um, then it is possible and compliant to transfer data outside the EU. And um, that, uh, that uh, really helps with the whole compliance aspect of data transfer. And we also have in our data processing addendum with a client, a kind of a general instructional client, and that is normally sufficient to make sure that data can be processed from, of pro, by processors on behalf of their controllers. And I'm going to talk about, a little bit more about data transfers in one of the later slides to kind of explain our approach to data transfers in, in, in general a bit more. The last myth I want to talk about was the, is, is the right to be forgotten. Um, we hear that very often from, even internally from people who are implementing our requirements is that, does this mean we need to delete each and every data from someone who requests it? And the answer is generally no, because the right to erasure, like many other rights, is not absolute. So as long as you as an institution have a legitimate reason why you need to keep personal information about a student or about your staff, then you don't need to delete that data. You only really need to delete data if you have kept it too long and it's not required anymore. If, for example, it was based on consent, consent has withdrawn, and some other factors. So basically, when you don't have a legitimate reason to keep it anymore, then of course you have to delete it. As long as you still have a legitimate reason to keep it, then you don't need to delete it. Okay, so um, one thing I also want to talk a little bit is the importance of data privacy. Um, because um, with the GDPR, it's quite easy to kind of look at everything you do kind of from a negative angle and say, well, we need to do this because otherwise you're gonna be fined by 4% global turnover, possibly or 20 million euros. And I think that that's obviously true, but we at Blackboard really kind of look at this from a kind of a positive perspective. 
we think that first of all, data privacy is human rights. So we as a good corporate citizen want to make sure that we have good data privacy practices. But we also think data privacy is, is a competitive advantage in today's environment where a lot of people feel they have kind of lost control over their data. And there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica is one of the latest scandals. So we feel if, if we do the right thing and have good data privacy practices, that builds trust with our clients, that builds trust with our end users. And then obviously students will much which would be much happier to use our tools and to share data because they know they can trust us. So I think that's, that's really one of the biggest incentives that we have to get this right. But of course, there's also the negative case that there is reputational damage, there will be the fines, there will be the loss of trust, and there could be individual claims if you don't get it right. And that's one of the, the reasons, um, and I'm not going to go through this slide in, in detail, you don't need to worry. Um, it's just to kind of show that really take this seriously and data privacy is not just me as the global privacy officer. You really kind of have data privacy represented at each level of our institution. It, it's a, an important topic for the board. Um, I'm regularly updating the audit committee of our board on our efforts. And just today, I'm actually going to talk to the compliance committee again and brief them. Um, and make sure that they're comfortable with our approach and with our documentation that we're pulling together. And we also have on the working level, we have a security council and my privacy program working group that we're making sure we can drive all the privacy related changes through the company. So I'm gonna spend, sorry, sorry I'm gonna stop here just in case there are any questions from anyone. Um, feel free to um, mention those in the chat or use the microphone option. Okay, it doesn't look like it. Um, so I'm going to uh, continue um, and just explain our program in a bit more detail. Um, not in every detail. <laughs> Stun silence is good. Uh, well, I hope it's good. Um, our approach is very much that, I mean, we have, we have, and I particularly, we have spent a lot of time, obviously, kind of enhancing all our processes. But I think many organizations, you don't really start from zero. I mean, data protection is not new. The principles, they have been in existence for a long time. So hopefully there's something good that you can build on just like we have. I mean, through our Privacy Shield certification, we, we had, had to make sure that we have really good contracts with our vendors and, and oversight, et cetera. And we can build on all these good efforts from the past. And the approach we've taken with those three, three phases is, is quite a typical approach. I mean, obviously, you need to start the kind of information gathering and we conduct, I think, 25 workshops last summer to make sure we, we fully understand how we process personal information, what kind of vendor we engage in, what kind of systems and applications we use. And I mean, to be fair, I mean, this is for every company. This is it's a very difficult process. And uh, obviously, in my kind of two previous uh, companies in Citigroup and Barclays, this has been an enormous effort to make sure that you understand the full picture of data processing. And we then moved on into the phase two, which was really making sure that we have the right internal privacy documentation that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and, and also making sure that we have implementation work stream to make sure that each functional area implements their required actions, that we do all the central uh, aspects of rolling out training, making sure we have privacy by design and privacy impact assessment, et cetera. And this slide, I'm not, in, I'm, I'm just including this because I think there's a the few things that how we set up our governance are quite helpful. And I think um, we, we wouldn't be at the point where we are now without, without the setup. And I think the most important thing is on, on the right side, we decided from the start that we need in each area, we need um, leads, and we call them GDPR leads, that can help us with the implementation, with the information gathering, with completing those actions. And we've made them responsible for that. And I think that that's quite important. So we have people in, in our corporate areas like IT, HR, um, our client support, uh, finance, et cetera, but also in all our product groups that can help us with, with all the requirements for, for the GDPR. And that has been very, very important to drive through our changes and make sure that we're meeting GDPR requirements. 
And this slide is just kind of giving a, a brief overview of kind of the, the admitted end state of the program and kind of the, some of the key aspects of our program from uh, me. And I'm not going to go through in all the detail, but we're going to talk a lot about them around documentation, what we're changing documentation wise, both internally, our internal standards, as well as externally, like our privacy statement or policy, what we're changing in terms of systems and also processes regarding privacy by design, and also what we do in terms of how we um, uh, change areas around people, making sure um, we have the right governance in place, we're rolling out enhanced training, and obviously make sure that we also can review our own state of compliance on a regular basis. So this is, this is kind of a typical slide that I use with, with meetings with our clients. Um, and uh, this is kind of the nice overview. So we have various aspects where we, with our program, really can help our clients. And I'm going to talk about two of them. And some of the other areas we're going to talk actually as part of the tips a bit later on. Um, we obviously need to make sure we have GDPR-ready products. We're going to talk about that. The, the privacy by design is very important that going forward, um, we have a good process to make sure that privacy is considered from the start in any kind of changes and product uh, modifications. Data transfers, we talked about, very important point, and we continue with the, what we call our multi-layered approach. Going to talk about that in a second a bit. Uh, we're also making sure that um, from your perspective, you need to have a contact with us. So we have a, a GDPR-ready data processing addendum um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a second as well. Uh, very important is, of course, that we also can manage our vendors so that when we engage uh, so-called sub-processes that help us provide the services to our clients, that these vendors meet the same standards that we are expected to meet. And then uh, security, I'm going to talk about that in a second a little bit as well. Um, obviously, we want to make sure that we're continuing to have good industry standard controls and continuously enhance those. And the last but not least, a very important with the new mandatory breach notification requirements is that um, we, and I mean everyone, really needs to have a good process um, in terms of if any kind of security incident happens that you can respond to and react to those quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So the two things I wanted to highlight just kind of very quickly and other aspects as mentioned, we're going to, I'm going to touch on um, later a bit in the tips and um, implementation approach. Uh, the first one is around data transfer. As I mentioned, we have yeah, Privacy Shield certified. We have the so-called model clauses or data transfer agreement in place. But um, I think it's also important that we, I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of two things. I mean, first of all, we always kind of convey the message that it's okay to have data moving outside the EU as long as there's data transfers. And we think that the kind of all these kind of data localization um, requirements or kind of decide to kind of keep data local are not necessarily helpful because we think quite often if you kind of take a global um, uh, approach where you have global vendors then the security is actually stronger so you have something localized under your own desk because that's quite often less secure so i think the idea that just because it's somewhere close with you it's more secure is quite often not correct so that's why we try to kind of also show that if you really want to kind of use scalable um, offers, not just from us, but from many other big providers, that means that data has to move, but obviously you need to make sure that data moves compliantly. But on the other hand, we also know that many EU um, clients, despite all of that, they still want to have the data in the EU. I very much respect that, and that's why we have a, a hosting strategy that's very much regional. So for all EU clients, we have all kind of our main products hosted in EU environments. And we do the same in Asia Park and, and US, and et cetera. So security, I'm not going to go through this slide in, in all detail. I mean, I work very, very closely with our um, chief information security officer and the security team. Um, and we have been spending a lot of time kind of enhancing our information security programs. Um, we have, for example, last year brought together the kind of the product uh, security team and the corporate security team, there was 
before that separately and kind of combine it to in one big kind of central security team. And that has helped us kind of to really drive changes across the company in a much more effective way. Uh, we're working on lots of kind of certifications in the US, for example, on, on the Federal certifications to make sure that, that we meet the, the, the client expectations and continuously improve our security. But now I think I want to get to, to really the meat um, of the, um, the presentation, the webinar here is really around the kind of some of the tips uh, in terms of implementation and kind of explaining how we translated some of the requirements. But before we go into that, I just also wanted to check if there are any questions in the chat or otherwise before I move on. Okay, very good. So the first two slides are really a more kind of tips how you start up your program and project. So, I mean, I hope that everyone by this time and about less than a month away from GDPR has kind of already has these stages way behind them and then I'm kind of in, in the implementation of it. But I think just to highlight a, a few things, I think as mentioned, it's very important to have kind of a network of people who can support you. If you don't have that, it's very, very hard to do this yourself because it's hard to understand what all, where all the data is. It's hard to kind of get things done if you don't have the support in, in the various functional departments. Secondly, kind of if you look at number four on the top of this slide, I think that that has been very crucial for us. And um, I have to admit it was quite easy here at Blackboard because there was very, very uh, high commitment from, from a senior management that GDPR and data privacy is very, very important that everyone needs to support this. Um, but um, quite frankly, my previous uh, uh, companies, it, it has been a bit harder where obviously as a financial service, there's a lot of competing priorities and making sure that you have se your senior managers to help you and make sure that people understand the importance of GDPR, that you get resources that you need, that you get the support from each area that you need, that if things don't move as fast forward in certain areas as they should be because everyone is just busy and most of the people do this as kind of a, a second or third or fourth role, you, you can make sure that your senior manager is going to help and making sure that this becomes a priority and they have time to do that. I think that that's really, really key. Um, but what I wanted to focus on here is really kind of some of the tips for the implementation phase. Um, that you can really use now I mean, kind of the last month or if, if your program needs to continue longer than the 25th May then um, over the next few months. Um, I already mentioned that I think the most important thing really is to, to make sure that you're not the only responsible person but you have people who support you and that you have the departments and someone in the department that is responsible for making sure that they implement um, all the GDPR requirements based on you or your colleagues um, defined requirements. And the second important thing, I think the 25th of May is really just the beginning from, from kind of two points of view. One is that, first of all, um, it's obviously important to make sure that you GDPR compliant from the 25th of May, but then a lot of the important processes and documentation that has been created, they only really start to kick in. So making sure that you do the data protection impact assessments where you need to making sure that if you engage a new vendor that actually all the required contract costs are in there and that you're comfortable that they're meeting your security and privacy standards. That's all work that's going to start um, if it hasn't started already, 25th of May. So there's a lot, a lot of work has probably in many organizations and many universities happened so far, but there's also a lot of work that will continue to happen under your data protection office order, uh, legal team and otherwise. Um, the second aspect of the 25th May, just the beginning is, and you may have seen that from the UK Information Commissioner, and we've seen that from other regulators like the French CNIL or the Belgian Privacy Commission, is that our regulators, they, they recognize that many companies have worked hard on GDPR, but GDPR is really a, a big challenge. And they understand that many organizations will not be able to complete all the action plans fully by the 25th of May. And the, Elizabeth Denham has said that very, very clearly in one of her a recent newsletter and, and, and the ICO conference recently. So I think that there will be some um, regulatory leniency for those who have 
first of all, kind of proof that they have action plans and they have been working on GDPR, but may not have been able to finish everything. Um, but obviously, that leniency will not apply to people who just take a, a wait and see approach. A few other key points kind of from our experience and kind of from discussions with clients and, and other privacy colleagues, I think that the, the privacy statement as the first one is, is really important um, because um, in the past and maybe even now, if you kind of Google around a little bit and read privacy statement, they have been written by lawyers like myself um, and uh, quite often in a legal, a legalese that is not very easily understandable. And the GDPR really doesn't accept this anymore. So it, the language should be much more clear and it should be plain so that everyone should be able to understand what kind of data has been collected, how is it being used, who is it being shared with. So I think um, and we are putting a lot of effort in, in making our privacy policy, which is already a decent privacy policy, but making it much better and easily understandable. But at the same time, the GDP also requires that um, a lot of detail is included in the, in the privacy statement or privacy policy. And that becomes difficult because you want to make this a privacy statement that people are actually able to read. But at the same time, you need to put in a lot of information. So I think what you see is a lot of companies, um, and we're trying to do the same, uh, trying to kind of some kind of layered approach where you can get some high level information if you don't have much time to understand the key points. And then if you want to understand a bit more about each of those points, there's more detail around that. And I think that's kind of going forward will be that the best practice standard that um, those who have more time to, and those who are interested in a lot of detail, they can find it. But generally that you start with kind of uh, a shorter version that people can get through quickly and don't have to spend hours to read it. Training, um, uh, training and awareness um, is, is very important, of course. But I think at the same time, I mean, you receive quite a lot of uh, kind of client questionnaires on, on our GDPR readiness, and what a lot of the questions are: Will you have GDPR training? And I think while it's important to have training that also explains the GDPR, I think it's much more important that your staff understand what they need to do than the specific GDPR requirements. I don't think it's very helpful to just have training that explains all the GDPR requirements. I think it's much more helpful if you tell your, um, your staff or your students, if you train them, how can they actually make this happen? So what kind of processes need, do they need to follow if there's an incident um, so that you can follow all the breach notification requirements? What do they need to do in their everyday life if they have a new project or there's a new use of personal information that should be reviewed? That's much more important in my view than kind of laying out all the kind of detailed GDPR requirements. Because quite frankly, I mean, as many of you will know, if you're going to be experienced, I mean, at the end of a training, there's maybe five to seven points that people take away. So I think it's very important that those five to seven points are actually points that people can take some action on and not just kind of uh, abstract GDPR requirements. Then in terms of data protection officer, that's obviously a, a key um, aspect for public authorities um, and private organizations as well if they meet certain requirements. I think it's important for universities to, to remember and other institutions to remember that you can actually have one single DPO for several public authorities, um, which the Article 20 the American Party has clarified, as long as kind of this makes sense based on the structure of the university, um, what kind of data is used, etc. But it, it's a possibility, and that's maybe something where um, there could be some synergies. Marketing is, I think it's quite interesting because, I mean, it, you probably, just like I, have received lots of emails from different organizations um, that uh, ask you to kind of re-consent or kind of subscribe in again for, for the various email newsletters that you receive. And this is quite interesting and, and this is highly debated by, by, by kind of the privacy community because the marketing rules don't really change with GDPR. There's a specific different piece, it's called the e-privacy directive and then the UK, the, the PECA, um, that's defined the requirements for sending unsolicited marketing. The change that we have is that because the standard for cons consent becomes higher, a lot of people, I guess, start to doubt that is the consent they've had in the past good enough to still be able to send some email marketing? Well, it should really be if you follow kind of the, the e-privacy directive and PECA in the past. 
I think one other important aspect is individual rights. Um, because uh, two, two things on that one. First of all, I think it's processes. I think um, while we, we actually conducted a, a survey um, with some of the people on the privacy newsletter to see kind of what they think, how many more individual right requests they will receive. Um, and most people said they think they're going to be an increase, but not a significant increase uh, in terms of those requests. But anyway, I think you need to have an institution, some kind of process that you know, okay, who needs to look at this first? Is it the legal department, whoever it is? How do you make them sure that we can find that where all the information is stored? Um, for example, if you use a learning management provider like us, kind of how do you make sure you reach out to us and we can, can support that as, as required? So those processes really need to be in place so you don't have to think about it when you receive those requests. The second aspect, I think, is that uh, around managing expectations. I mean, as I mentioned, that a lot of these um, rights have limitations, there are exemptions. And I think through kind of the information that has been received a lot, there is a, a wrong expectation that some of these rights are absolute. And I think it's very important that when you train staff, when you explain um, the rights to your students and other users, that you make sure that they understand while they have rights, these rights also have limitations so that they're not getting disappointed and you don't have issues explaining that later on. Then I think one of the things that many organizations grapple with are, are legacy issues. Um, with, well, I mean, um, with legacy issues, I really mean things that you should have had done in the past, but that are really hard to accomplish. Um, for example, the typical thing is records management. Many organizations aren't very good at records management. It's very difficult to make sure that you only keep data as long as required and you delete it when you no longer need it. Um, Similar with security, um, it's very hard in kind of smaller organizations to make sure that you have a consistent approach that people don't use uh, unapproved tools like SurveyMonkey to, for, for personal information, that you, you make sure that people don't use USB sticks if it's not encrypted. Um, that's easier if you're in a bigger organization like us, but it's still challenging. And obviously, while the GDPR doesn't really change these kind of principles, uh, there's an increased focus on that. And of course, I mean, we talked about the possible regulatory leniency about some of the new GDPR requirements. The ICO and other regulators will not be understanding that you're not complying with those because these are not new requirements, but requirements that should have been in place for a long time. And then the last one, I mean, and that, that's really a challenge, I think, for everyone to kind of stay abreast of what's going on. If you're purely UK-based, it's a bit easier because there's a really fantastic, uh, I mean, the ICO, the UK Information Commissioner, is doing a fantastic job of making sure there's information available that explains in simple steps what you need to do and also constantly updates that information about the GDPR requirement. So, I mean, that, if you're in the UK-based, um, like, I think most of you, that should really be your per first port of call because there's so much helpful information there. So I stopped there quickly in terms of any questions. I think Martin, there was some kind of chat going on, but I don't think there's any questions for me so far. So yeah, I don't think there were any questions, so um, feel free to continue. Thank you, Martin. So um, in this next section, I want to talk a little bit how we translated some of the GDPR requirements into practice because quite a, a lot of them are at quite a high level and then it's really up to the organization to, to break this down into manageable and actionable steps that you can actually accomplish. Um, the first one is around internal documentation. So there's a GDPR requirement around having data protection policies in place. Um, and there's some caveats where proportionate in relation to the processing activities, but obviously if you process a lot of student data, then you, you would likely be expected to have some internal policies as well around making sure that you define how you want to treat that data from a privacy perspective. There should also be some standards around records management. Um, we have quite detailed standards because obviously we have a, a lot of information that we treat on behalf of a client if you also have a really dedicated client data standard, and we have standards around privacy by design approach, how we deal with marketing, how we deal with individual rights, HR, et cetera. So we have those detailed standards. But I think the important thing here is also that um, this really depends on your, on your organizational bit, how much detail you need. 
um, and how you actually phrase the, the, the related building. We have some, some really good templates from our external council that we're using, but we also spend a lot of time um, to kind of break that down and, and be very, very specific. So I'll give you an example uh, on, on our vendor standard. We had, I mean, it was a really good vendor standard template that we received, but it was very generic and kind of uh, regarding requirements to obviously have a contract in place to make sure that you do due diligence. Um, we just took that and changed it quite dramatically just to kind of basically tie back to our vendor and procurement process and just making sure that people follow that vendor and procurement process. And then we made sure that in the vendor and procurement process, we had all the necessary um, controls and documentation embedded so that as long as people follow the normal vendor process, then almost automatically all the necessary privacy steps will be followed. The privacy by design, that's, that's all, I think that's kind of my favorite area um, in kind of all the implementation activities that we implement, because I think that's really where you can make sure that going forward, um, the GDPR implementation hasn't been a one-off, but that actually all the new um, vendors that you are um, engaging with, all the new um, systems that you're using, any kind of new um, personal data that you're collecting, that is reviewed and, and really make sure that it's, it's done in a, in a way that minimizes the impact on the privacy of individuals and meets all, all the privacy requirements. And we combine this with the data protection impact assessment because we really think that this, these two things fit together and kind of should work hand in hand. So the process that we developed is that um, we made sure that in all our change processes and through our uh, we call them data privacy champions, so the people on the ground, that we can make sure that if there's a material change, how we process personal information, then um, there's a privacy by design checklist that needs to be completed. If it's high risk, we do the full data protection impact assessment, of course, as is required by the GDPR. But even if it's not high risk, we want to make sure that we can complete the checklist so that we have documented how we deal with it and how we minimize the risk and how we um, um, meet all the privacy requirements as a best practice. And I mean, this is, this is something, it's not completely new for us. We've done this kind of legal reviews for a long time. It's now much more formal and much better documented. But in many areas, it's also, it, it's, it's gonna be a, work in, a long work to get us this fully em embedded and automated and making sure this happens all the time, like in many organizations. So I think that's why I say the 25th of May is really the start and kind of continuing to educate people that they need to do this and explain to them how to do it, support them with all of that. So that, that's gonna be a lot of work I expect in, in the next, uh, in the kind of second half of year of this year for, for myself. I mentioned that uh, we obviously made changes to uh, on making changes to our um, products, the various products like we have, like the one we're using now, Collaborate Ultra, to make sure that we can help our clients be in compliance themselves, because obviously everyone needs to make sure that the vendor can have sufficient guarantees that they're uh, providing um, products and processing personal information that meet the GDPR requirements. And um, we making changes, for example, where we have products that have user interfaces that clients can actually include their own privacy policy or statement linked to that. We did a lot of work in reviewing our systems for data fields that we think could be unnecessary or that could be made optional or where there's any opportunity to use rather than fully identified information, some pseudonymous or anonymous data. And key of it is also, of course, making sure that if, um, uh, a client like you, um, or an institution that uses our products, um, has a request from an individual regarding access to data, correcting it, deleting it, or data portability request, that actually we can help with that if it pertains to data that's on our product. And again, we, we did this based on um, some really good um, guidance that we had from external counsel, but again, which was quite legal. So we worked a lot of time. We had various workshops with our product development, product management team to make sure we break this down into good product requirements across the board. And then we kind of took these general product requirements and really looked at each product and kind of implemented specific actions for each product to make sure that they can meet those requirements. 
One of the, the key requirements on the GDPR is that you as a data controller, your institution needs to have a um, data processing agreement or kind of contract in place with your vendors as, as data processors to make sure that some of the requirements um, are documented specifically and in detail in a contract. Um, the requirement of a contract in place is not new. And I mean, to be honest, lots of these um, requirements that you see listed here on the slide, and I'm not going to go through all of them, are really requirements that we've had in the past as best practice. For example, that um, staff of your vendor need to sign confidentiality agreements. That has been standard practice for a long time. They need to have appropriate security measures. Um, but some of the elements that you may not have seen in the past as much was that obviously helping with um, uh, information, with Breach notification, which is a new requirement, with kind of things like data protection impact assessment and these kind of things. So we have already last July updated our data processing um, addendum to make sure that this is fully ready for GDPR. And we have been using that for standard contracts. And obviously, in some cases, we also have specifically negotiated contracts with our, with our vendors. And I think that's important that. Um, Obviously, with your vendors, you have the right contract in place. That's, that's quite an easy fix. Um, I think the difficulty is more to understand who all your vendors are. That's sometimes a bit of a challenge. Um, but um, the good news for you, it will be that to have such an agreement in place is not just your requirement as a data controller. It's also a requirement of your data processor. So they will have an interest in helping you making sure that there's a contract in place with all these points between you and them. Talking about vendors, I think uh, vendors, um, what I've seen in the past is that quite often um, the kind of the relationship with vendors is mainly focused on contracts, and that's obviously an important aspect of it. But uh, particularly when I'm with GDPR, it's quite clear that there needs to be more than just a contract in place. So you need to be comfortable that um, your vendor is meeting all the requirements that they promise uh, in, in the contract and to do some kind of vendor due diligence. And we have received, as mentioned, quite a few uh, vendor questionnaires from our clients and continue to do so. And we do the same with our vendors. We kind of send them um, uh, any new vendors that need to kind of complete a vendor security assessment questionnaires with some privacy questions. We also, as part of kind of a GDPR product, send to existing vendors questions around how their systems meet the GDPR requirements. And I think that's important that you get comfort around that your vendors can meet all these requirements, and that you also understand that they can't meet them and can make the, the right decisions if that's something that the vendor can maybe address in the future, or if that's something that's an important to you that you may have to look for an alternative. Yeah, so we have, we have this vendor security assessment questionnaires. We have a defined vendor risk management program. And I think that's, I mean, this is something that we have only really formalized in more detail recently. And I think from my experience, I know this is very, very difficult in many organizations because there may not always be a central procurement and vendor process, but I think it's really key to understand who your vendors are so you can have the right contact in place. So while this may not be a specific GDPR requirement, I think this is one of the aspects that you will really struggle to meet the GDPR requirement if you don't have a good vendor and procurement in place where all of this information is kind of managed and handled centrally. I think this is the last slide I wanted to talk about. And again, this is just to mention that in terms of the new mandatory breach notification, it's really important that you have a process in place. And it shouldn't just be a document that you have come up with and kind of written down. It really should be something that you have already tested or that you start testing um, with some tabletop exercises and kind of fictitious examples. Because I think it's important, and we do this on a, on a regular basis, that you have these kind of tabletop exercises where you can understand how would we get that information if we need it? Who would we need to engage um, if, for example, someone hacked database X or system X? How would we react and en engage with any other third parties that we need to engage? How would we inform the UK Information Commissioner? If you have gone through that uh, and do that regular basis, then you have to come for that should something really happen, you're well prepared because if something happens, then you, you're not going to have time to think about it and develop your approach. So you really have to have this approach ready for, for that worst case scenario. 
So yeah, I, as mentioned, I have um, the uh, more resources in the appendix, and I'm happy to share those slides afterwards um, by you, Martin, um, and you can put those on, on the website. Um, but obviously, I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, one thing I just want to quickly mention, and you have the links on the slide, is we, we have uh, produced a GDPR white paper, which provides a bit more information on many of these things I've talked about. We also have, and that's um, really for you if you're kind of using Blackboard, we have a data privacy and security group uh, where we provide regular updates, and we also have a, a Blackboard data privacy newsletter. Um, that's not exclusively to our client. Um, we use that to kind of provide updates generally in terms of what's happened legal and regulatory wise, but also obviously about what we are doing in terms of GDPR and other data privacy efforts. So if you're interested, just send me an email on the email address that you see on the screen, and I'll add you to the distribution list of that. So I'll stop here. If there are any questions that you have based on all the slides that I went through. Thanks for it, Seth. That, that was a, a fascinating overview of um, GDPR and I think some very useful uh, guidance and tips for people. If anyone has a question, please um, raise your hand and we can, uh, you can use the microphone or you can enter something into the chat. Um, well, people are perhaps thinking of um, uh, oh, Patrice is saying uh, nice to have an international overview. So uh, I, I agree. So what, one of the questions I had was um, you mentioned um, consent as as one of the the areas of GDPR. I was just wondering how recording consent is is that integrated differently within different Blackboard products, or is it very much um, reliant on the institution to to gain consent, at, you know, at enrollment or registration? How, how is that working out? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, we, I mean, um, I've maybe taken a step back. That kind of very much kind of at the core of the whole kind of data control and data process uh, relationship. And I should have maybe explained that in a bit more detail for those who are not uh, absolutely familiar with that. So data control is basically the organization that determines how personal information is used and why. Um, and then uh, the data processor is, is the organization that just follows the instruction and really uses and processes that personal information on behalf of the data controller. And um, that's obviously a very, very black and white concept. There's lots of grays in between, but generally for all the products, we, we're the data processor, we're providing that to our clients and kind of follow their instruction, how exactly they want to set it up and, and they decide what kind of personal information they want the students to provide through that. So the consent requirement is really one for um, for the, our clients and universities to obtain. Um, we have in our GDP requirements not focused a lot on consent because we think where universities actually use our systems, it will very, very rarely be on, on a voluntary basis where again, we have that free choice, but it will be something that students will have to use. So we obviously leave it to the, to the clients. They can still get the consent, but we didn't build in as kind of a systematic capability into our product because we think many institutions will come to the determination that content is probably not the best thing, how we can legitimately process information if we use a vendor like Blackboard and systems like Collaborate or Learn and Moodle rooms that we're providing. So uh, as part of that, did you end up producing you know, a standard statement that your clients could use or was it very much up? to them to uh, decide how they, they would implement that? Yeah, so what we're doing is for, for our products is that we, we are um, providing them the ability to include the, the privacy policy um, in as part of the kind of the login as well as in the system where there's a kind of a, there's a user interface. Um, we, we are very happy to help any clients, but obviously I, I think it's quite difficult for us to kind of provide, because we were actually thinking about it, should we kind of provide some kind of standard guides and all of this? But I think the difficulty here is that um, it really depends client by client from our experience, how exactly they use our systems and kind of what kind of systems they use. So it's very hard to kind of provide some to a client that would really meet client expectations, be meaningful and, and also helpful. So we decided not to not provide something, but obviously um, we, we very 
keen to support our clients and be helping lots of clients with not just kind of contracts that need different place, but also the questions they may have where we can help with our privacy experience. Uh, thanks for it. Um, are there any uh, questions from our participants? So, um, I suppose another question perhaps is um, from, from your position, Stefan, do you, do you see, um, you know, as we are um, less than a month <laughs> away from me, and I do, I, um, I know you mentioned the fact that the, the ICO is um, perhaps going to be lean in, in certain aspects of GDPR if uh, institutions have um, started work on, on this area, but do, do, what's your sense of how prepared uh, the sector is for GDPR? I know some of the uh, participants in the uh, in, in the webinar have already had local training within their institutions. What, what, what's kind of your uh, view, kind of, with, with kind of a perhaps a ability to look across the sector? Yeah, so that, that's a good and a bit of a tricky question. I'm, I'm just going to explain kind of based on kind of my experience and discussions with the various clients that we have is that I think a lot in the kind of education sector struggle with kind of being fully prepared uh, by 25th of May. Um, I know we had lots of interactions with our clients in terms of contracts in place, but obviously that that's only one aspect. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it's not just the education um, sector. I think, I mean, if, if you look at all the studies that come out, um, I mean, most, as I think it's almost half of kind of the, the small and medium-sized enterprises that are not aware of GDPR. I mean, just ask your kind of local, um, I don't know, dentist or GP what, what they're doing about GDPR. I mean, this is, this is an enormous challenge for, for these kind of small yeah. organizations. And some of them have very, very sensitive data. But I think a lot of sectors will struggle to get that in place. And I mean, to be honest, even what I hear from my colleagues, like really, really big organizations, the, the challenges are slightly different because there's just the sheer number of vendors that need to be engaged. It's, it's just the scope and the kind of the scale that makes it very, very challenging. I think there's going to be, and I mean, what do you hear when you go to this previous event? There are many law firm partners and experts say that there will be very, very few companies that are fully 100% compliant and would swear to that. So I think there's general, that, that's the general trend across the various sectors. And I think um, while most of kind of the responsible vendors like us are, are really working hard to kind of get everything done by 25th of May, I think there will also be a lot of, particularly the kind of the smaller organizations and companies that will find it very, very hard to, to meet that target date. Well, hopefully um, we've, um set some people along the way to um, be, being uh, a, a lot more prepared for the 25th of May. I'm conscious of time, so uh, I'd uh, like us uh, all to thank Stefan for uh, taking the time to uh, share his experience and um, uh, insight into to GDPR. So um, if, um, if you show some applause or happy faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Thank Martin, you. and thanks for the opportunity to speak here to, to everyone, and thanks for everyone for attending. Um, it, I'm, I'm always happy to do that, and um, good luck with your GDP implementation if, if you're um, working on those. Um, I know how hard it is for everyone, so you have all my sympathy and empathy. Um, <laughs> and all I said about, obviously, regulatory leniency, I mean, we, we are not lenient and no one should be lenient. I mean, everyone should work very hard to get everything in place by the 25th of May. So, so good luck, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for that.